Uh, nested fixed point versus MPEG methods. First of all, let me define, describe what the, uh, what the terms are. Now, in economics, we often do nested methods, where what we do is we... Um, okay, somebody had the microphone on. Was I supposed to hear that? Anyway. Um, in general equilibrium, for example, you need to solve the problem, find the price such as excess demand at that price vector um, is zero. But you often can't write down the excess demand function in an analytical fashion. So what can you do? And here's an iterative process that one can um, look at is that what you do, let's say you have the supply function, you, you have a, okay, you, ha you have a supply function abstractly, you have a demand function. Now, what one could do is a supply function, given the prices, it's, let's say, a numerically difficult problem it's to solve out for what the supply is. And so perhaps you have to, sol have to look at what the firm's optimization problems are at a, at a vector of prices, and that involves solving an optimization problem for them. And you do that numerically, so you have a routine that takes a price vector and spits out a vector of supplies of goods. Now then the price can be easily um, computed by just computing the marginal utility vector uh, of the output, uh, which basically the demand inverse is the marginal utility. Um, and so then you get a new guess for prices. So this is an example, and then you can iterate. So this is an example of what we would think of as a, a nested kind of approach where you, the nesting is this. In the S function, um, is something you have to do numerically. And then, but each time you do the S function, you have to do something more numerically. Uh, and then the outer loop is the one where you're iterating on the prices. So you fix prices, then that gives you a quantity, you fix the quantity, and then you get a new set of prices, and we loop around now. So uh, the question is, you have, two, you have two numerical issues going on here. First of all, uh, the numerical part of computing each S of P. Well, you're gonna have to have a stopping rule. You're not gonna get exact solutions, you're gonna have to have a stopping rule imposed for that. And then the other iteration, the outer loop, where you, where you uh, iterate on prices, that's also a numerical procedure, and you're going to have to stopping rule for that. Now, what, what, iter what should the stopping rules be? Now, the general fact is that um, you always lose digits of precision. Um, in any numerical operation. And so let's say that inner loop, the supply curve, was, um, was the output of some numerical computation. And let's say you start with data that's Q-digit accurate, then the output in terms of supply can only be re relied on to Q over two digits. But then remember that the, the supply vector thing is then sort of inside the outer loop of a numerical procedure. And you're gonna stop and rule on that. But now the supply function is giving this outer loop iteration something with only Q over two digits precision. And so now um, you start with Q digits at the bottom level for the supply function and you end up only with Q over four digits accurate at the upper level. In the final out, the outer loop. So anytime you see yourself nesting, that you're, 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 you fix some of the variables and then uh, that, and then you, you fix those and then you compute some of the other variables and then that whole process is then inside some other loop, you're gonna have problems of, bad problems of uh, quality. Um, because you're going to be losing digits. And I, I saw a paper years ago where they had three layers of this. Um, so that's not 
a good idea. Now, okay, so that's a very, there's a general comment on numerical methods that involve nesting, where you, 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 pick, you fix some variables and then you do some numerical computation. And then the other, the, the variables that you fixed are, they, they are then solved out for by some other numerical procedure, which is repeatedly calling this inner loop. So, and in general, you're gonna lose digits at every time you layer on. Okay, put that aside for the moment. And now let's look at um, very simple problem in economics, very simple. Suppose you want, suppose you have, uh, uh, you observe demand, you observe price. Now demand is observed with, or purchases are observed with some error. Uh, and we wanna, you wanna estimate the demand function. So what your data for demand is Q, and that's, what you, that's what the data is Q. Now the true demand is Q minus epsilon. Um, you, see, you, see, you see true demand plus some noise. Um, now let's assume that you have some parametric form for the utility function. So the utility function is U of C, some function, and then beta is a vector of parameters. And what you're gonna wanna do is estimate these parameters from your demand data. Now economic theory says that the price that let's say price is observed without error. And so given the price, the true demand is governed by this equation that price equals the margin utility of the, the true demand, which is observed with some error. You see that Q is the observed and then epsilon is the unknown error. So you have that as a problem. Now, uh, what did I learn? in uh, my uh, first semester uh, econometrics course, uh, yeah, 41 years ago, um, is that now suppose that you have a utility function and you know, suppose it's quadratic, then what you do is you solve out for the demand function, which is this. And so the ith data point satisfies this, that the observed observation, the data, is equal of the of the ith data point is equal to one minus the price that the ith person sees. Now we see the thing is that different people see different prices. That's where you're going to get some variation um, in order to identify the uh, the demand function, and then divide by two beta and then plus the epsilon. So now what you see is that this epsilon is Q, the uh, observed data minus on, on the on demand and then minus the predicted demand. And then you sum up the square of these errors and you do least squares. Okay, looks nice. Now suppose that you've decided to have a more nonlinear demand function. Let's say that your demand function now is a uh, a higher order polynomial. I'm not saying this is a sensible demand function on the other, but by the way, this is a convex utility function as long as beta is uh, positive. So this, this is a well um, behaved uh, utility function. And so then now again, we take the first order condition and we find that margin utility has to equal price. Now, so the next step is to solve out for demand, C, um, as a function of P. Well, you hit a problem here. There is no closed form solution for that demand function. This is a rather deep result in algebra, it goes back to Abel, um, and what who proved that uh, if you have a polynomial of degree five or greater, there's no closed form solution. And by closed form solution, we mean a prescribed formula involving a, a finite uh, a set of elementary arithmetic operations. So what do I do then? Well, 
generally the attitude is uh, change the model. So um, that's what the general response is or strategy is. Now, what I'm gonna to describe to you is uh, a method for solving problems like this, where you don't have closed form solutions for demand functions or closed form solutions for policy rules, value functions, whatever. Um, and this is, uh, we've, we've dubbed it MPEC, uh, Mathematical Programming with Equilibrium Conditions. Uh, now, it is just straightforward, um, not un un you know, constrained optimization. However, uh, the fact is that our constraints are going to be equilibrium conditions, mainly that people are on their demand function. And so that was a literature in the um, numerical math uh, literature that um, developed uh, in the 90s and was an um, active area in the early 2000s and 2010s. And so, uh, th by the way, this was developed first by Chaylin Su and me. And, and our math buddies um, told us about the, the MPEC literature, and so we dubbed it MPEC. Um, so uh, this is, the approach is quite straightforward. You write down, you don't solve out for the demand function in a closed form. You just uh, write down all the first order conditions for every individual that you have in your sample and then uh, use constrained optimization. Now, how does that mean, what does that mean in this case? Well, you see, in general, we know the price um, is gonna be equal to the marginal utility of true consumption, and true consumption is observed um, consumption demand minus some noise. So we know that this equation holds true for every person I. So for every person I, for every data point, and so if you have 10,000 people, this is 10,000 equality constraints. Um, and so what we do is we say, we wanna minimize some of these squared errors. So minimize some of the squared errors. And so we have, but we don't know exactly what the errors are. So we not only choose beta, the parameters, to do this minimization, but we also choose the epsilons in such a way that minimizes. And the thing is we have to jointly choose the beta and the epsilon vector so that everybody is on their demand curve. Um, now, to some extent, this seems trivial, but um, it's also, um, hard to, okay, it's hard to appreciate the, um, the importance of this often. Now, now in, the, in the case of a quadratic utility function, then you, you wouldn't do the, you wouldn't substitute out for the consumption as a function of price. You just say, okay, here's a bunch of, um, of uh, in this case, linear constraints. Um, so here, actually what we do is we, we choose out, basically, I could have done it up here too, but here I, busted it out that CI equals QI, true consumption is observed um, demand minus some noise and put that in the utility function. So then in this case, the way I write it is, I'd be choosing the CIs and the epsilon Is and the beta to minimize the sum of squared errors. Now, is this the same as least squares? Uh, absolutely it is. Um, it's the same thing, you're solving the same problem. Um, so it is the same problem. Now, in the degree six case, you now have the problem formulated in a fashion that you can send off to a constrained optimizer. You just say, oh, my, my objective is to minimize the epsilon i's, uh, and I need to pick some ci's and epsilon i so that uh, the person is on, the true consumption is on the person's demand curve and um, data, the data equals the true consumption plus some noise. Uh, you can't solve out for these epsilons explicitly in terms of the price, but 
you can do it this way. So you can still do least squares estimation. Um, now, is this, okay, this, I'm, by the way, I, I'm doing this, oh, okay, let me use, okay, sorry. Let's just proceed. So this is the same. You do it this way or solving out, it's the same thing. Now, by the way, even if you can solve out in closed form for the demand function, perhaps you might decide, nah, that's not a good idea. If the utility function was degree four polynomial, then the margin utility function is a uh, degree three polynomial, and which has closed form solution. You gotta worry that two of them are probably con con complex numbers. But um, uh, here's the formula for your uh, demand function. Your demand function Q is equal to this stuff, uh, these betas, and then you got the W and W is equal to that. And then, uh, um, then there's, these, there's this Z thing that shows up in the W expression. Well, Z is a, a square root of Z1 plus Z2, and here's a Z1 and Z2. Okay, I don't think I would care to write that utility function down. It's, by the way, I don't even know if, uh, it's not, the problem here is that your optimizer may choose values of beta such that uh, uh, this square, this square, the inside the square root, you have a complex number, so that a negative number. So, who knows if that's yeah, you'd be who knows you could end up um, with a nasty um, situation here. Um, so, this isn't even though you can solve it out in closed form. Uh, you it may not be right to send to the. Um, Solver. Now, now, how would other people do this problem? Now, another way of doing this problem is what we would call nested fixed point iteration. Now, let me back up to my consumption example. Um, if this were the the problem you're trying to solve, what a nested fixed point procedure would do is first given any of these um, prices and data, given PI and the data QI, it would then for each I solve numerically the solution to this polynomial to find out what epsilon I is. So that would be your inner loop. So you would numerically solve out for all these epsilon, for each epsilon i, for all the data points, do that numerically. Um, this is when you fix a beta, you do that numerically for all these epsilons. And then, oh, and now I've got the epsilon vector. And then I just sum the squares um, of the epsilons. And then I proceed um, with uh, minimizing the, uh, sum of squared errors. But now this is, notice the nesting is that you, you, you fix the beta and then you do a lot of nonlinear equation solving in order to figure out what the epsilon i is um, given the pi and the beta. And so then you do all that work and then you take those epsilons, um, sum the squares, but then now this outer loop thing, you're gonna to have to use minimizing the sum of squared error. So that's a numerical procedure, um, not a real hard one in this case, but um, a numerical procedure, you have to iterate over the epsilon i's, over, over the betas. Yeah, you see you're minimizing over the betas. Um, so yeah, so the objective here is a function of beta after you do these computations. So given a beta, you come up with an epsilon vector, you square it, and then now you've got to optimize over the beta. So the outer loop is fiddling around with beta guesses, but each time you do a beta guess, then you solve all these things. That's the nested fixed point approach to doing this. Now, in general, here's a description of the general approach to nested fixed point. Suppose you have a collection of exogenous numbers, your data, and you want to solve out 
um, suppose you have a problem where yeah, you know you want to solve it for x, but then you also know that there's some constraints between some variables y and x uh, display it, expressed by this equation, g of x comma y is zero. And let's say that that's x of y, y of x. And so what you do is um, uh, for any given x, you then use this equation to solve out for the y um, of that x. And then uh, you go round and round and round. And, and this is then an unconstrained optimization problem conditional on having a routine procedure that does compute the y of the x's. Um, so this is the general form of um, nested fixed point methods. Now, by the way, many of you probably are aware of nested fixed point uh, prop, um, regions or problems um, in the I.O. literature. Uh, the phrase nested fixed point was um, created by John Rust in his 1986 paper on estimating the behavior of uh, Harold Zerker, who was the bus uh, repair manager at the Madison Bus Company. And so uh, Rust got data on decisions this guy made, and then he tried to infer from the data uh, what the uh, what the what Mr. Zerker's decision rule was for whether to repair a bus or um, or or not to do a machine replacement or just do minor or do minor uh, repairs. Now, I am not introducing that and that's a fixed point to you in the context of that paper for a good reason. Um, when you learn about nested fixed point from that perspective, you, you, it, carries, it carries along all sorts of baggage um, related to discrete choice, et cetera, et cetera, dynamic programming that really disguises what, re what is going on mathematically. So that's why I do this um, simple thing about demand functions. Um, because it, this, the the key this illustrates the key features of the MPEC approach is that instead of solving out for solving out some nonlinear system of equations in order to get these epsilons or what, whatever else you're going to use in order instead of doing that repeatedly you just write all those first order conditions out in one long list those are constraints you have your objective in my case, it was epsilon sum of squared errors. Now, you could be that the, the objective could be a, a likelihood function. You want to min, maximize likelihood, and the likelihood is a function of these epsilons. Um, so that's what's going on. The point here is that instead of doing this nested business uh, with all this auxiliary computation, you just write the whole problem down in one big fashion. Um, now, nested methods tend to be slow. See, the thing is this, that anytime you're doing a nested approach, so you're, you're fixing some parameters, um, like in my demand cases, that beta parameter in, in the dynamic programming case, it's some other theta, vector of theta parameters. You fix those, and then you, in, in my demand case, you perfectly solve for what the um, epsilons would be given the data and given the parameters. So you spend a lot of time and effort to solve that exactly. Um, but then once you do that, and then you look, if you find out what the sum of squared errors are, and then you try another beta, well, then you've got to do a lot of work on that new beta guess. And so each time you guess a different beta, you're going to have to do a lot of computational work. And the thing is that having a good solution to each choice of beta is essential to get this to work right. But, every, but, but when you have the, but the results from your first guess are really of no help in helping you solve for this next guess of beta. So it's a lot of work, uh, which is then kind of thrown away because the next time you have a beta guess, 
you got to start from scratch in terms of solving all for these epsilons. Now, so it's a lot of work. And also, whenever you have a nesting thing, you've got to realize that uh, what, every time you do a level, you're, every time you're doing a numerical procedure, you're losing precision. So the inner, the, if the input to the inner loop is Q digits, then the output's only going to be Q over two digits um, accurate. And then, so then the input to the outer loop is only Q over two digits accurate. You're only going to end up with Q over four. And how this is going to display is, uh, is that the fact is that you're going to have a hard time putting in tight convergence criterion. So you might think, oh, the inner loop um, uh, convergence criterion of 10 to the minus 4 is good. Um, but then when you try to do a 10 to the minus 4 convergence criterion in the outer loop, you realize that uh, this, this procedure never converges. Well, that's because you, you gave it only four-digit accuracy data, and then the numerical process is going to lose a few digits. So you can't ask for four-digit accuracy. You can only ask for two which is, by the way, what happens in a lot of the empirical I.O. literature from the Nesta fixed point approach, um, is that the quality does fade. Um, so this is, nested, nested methods have this very bad disadvantage. Now, And I say here, constrained optimization to the rescue. So now let's go back to the abstract form. Suppose you want to solve this abstract problem, but really what you're really solving is this constrained optimization problem. Uh, f of x comma, maximize f of x comma y, subject to the fact that maybe it's the x's that you care about, but then you have to, you have to also pick out these y's intermediate things, but it's all one constrained optimization problem. So um, what are the advantages of this? Well, you can just write these things down, whatever your likelihood function is in terms of the epsilons and whatever else, write it down and then write down these expressions that say how the residuals should be related to the data or whatever, whatever your application is and you just write them down and send it off to solvers written by professionals. By the way, professionals do not write code for nested fixed point methods. Um, in fact, in mathematical programming, what we call nested fixed point is called implicit programming. Um, it's not a major area of interest. It, the phrase pops up occasionally, um, but by, by and by, it's, uh, this is not, particularly today, is not used much. And also, so the thing is, you just write this down. You don't have to construct an algorithm to compute a y given an x. Um, and also, you can have uniformly tight criterion for convergence on all the x's and the y's. And also, the thing is that, by the way, in the nested fixed point literature in I.O., uh, there's a tendency to use um, Nelder Mead for the outer loop which is a pretty crummy method. Um, and now some people would use, I, I think um, uh, Nelder Mead is what um, uh, uh, was used in the BLP, initial BLP papers um, by BLMP, and then um, uh, also in, in the successor paper by Nevo. Uh, so that's a very slow, um, in, and it's a thing that you can't really impose tight stopping rules on it. Um, and then now what, what Russ did is used um, BHHH, Burnt uh, Hall Hall Houseman, um, which basically is a kind of quasi-Newton kind of approach. Anyway, but what happens here is that you write it down in this fashion, and then you can use, like on, in MATLAB, you can use fmincon with the SQP option or in cherry point option. And if you are in ample, there's, and then, or GAMS, then you have like a half a dozen different solvers that can, you can try, find out which one works best. 
Um, so that's the flexibility. Now, uh, one of my favorite seminars ever was when I presented this at a conference. This would have been 2006 or seven. And it was an empirical IO um, conference. And so then I laid this out um, in the context of, uh, first in the context of the rust bus problem. And then also uh, after I laid out the basic thing, then Che Lin talked about applying this to dynamic games. Um, but uh, the first part of the seminar was the, uh, let's say the most uh, energetic one. Um, because the people in the audience did notice that the number of constraints that we had was very large. There were many, many, many constraints. And so the response was, well, this, they didn't, they didn't dispute that it was a way to do the estimation. They said, well, you can't do this. That's just too many constraints. And I said, why? And they said, well, you've got to compute the Jacobians. And taking finite difference of all the Jacobians is, is going to eat up an enormous amount of time. And I said, well, why would you take finite differences? Um, you could use automatic differentiation, which is a topic you're going to hear about um, week after next. Um, and then they had never heard of automatic differentiation. Um, and then they said, well, still you're Jacobian, you know, if you have a, if you have 10,000 data points and you know, your Jacobian is going to be 10,000 by 10,000, uh, and then no, no computer can handle that. And I said, well, no, the thing is that each, each line or each block of lines will involve a single data point. And so the Jacobian is going to be extremely sparse. And so the number of non-zero elements in the Jacobian of the constraints will be they're very small. In fact, the Jacobian is going to grow in the number of non-zero elements is going to be proportional to n, not n squared, where n is like the, the number of data points in your um, in your data. So um, anyway, it was um, it, it was fun. Um, all these are all very highly educated um, uh, people with degrees. Um, at far more prestigious universities than any one I studied at, um, but yet they um, they had no idea what I was talking about. Um, now, the other thing I always like to emphasize, though, is that Chaylin and I wrote the first version of of our MPEC paper in 2006. That so was 20 years after Rust published paper in 1986. What I like to point out is that um, what Che Lin and I described, you could have tried it back in 1986. The software, uh, part of the software is available. I don't know about the automatic differentiation, but um, anyway, you could have tried this with the nonlinear um, optimizers they had then. Basically, it was mostly just Minos, the uh, early one. Um, but the key thing was that back in 1986, when you talked about RAM, uh, the number 64 came up, but it wasn't 64 gigabytes. It wasn't 64 megabytes. It was more like 64 kilobytes. RAM was very limited on a PC or even a modest desktop. You didn't have the RAM to actually do um, what I'm describing. Now, what the nested fixed point method is, it's what we call a low memory method. And so if you don't have much memory, then that's the kind of method you have to use uh, because you don't, have, you don't have to store so much at any one time. Um, so in 1986, of course he wrote the paper in like 82 or 83, um, at the time that he did the work, um, the RAM, constraint was really a very binding constraint and uh, meant that he had to do a low memory approach. And that is what nested fixed point is. It's very good, v reduces the memory requirements enormously. And so you can get it to work. Now, however, memory is not a problem today because now you have gigabytes of RAM on your computer 
And so Ram is not a problem. Now, the other thing that happened between 86 and 2006 was a substantial development in the improvement of the software. Um, because, um, but in those 20 years, uh, the optimizers were incorporating um, software tools which would do the calculus to compute the derivatives automatically, efficiently. That's automatic differentiation. So you don't have to do finite differences. The computer, you don't even have to think about it. The computer will do it for you. See, what happened is that between 1986 and 2006, uh, computers decided to um, learn calculus. And so they know how to calculus. They can do your calculus for you. Uh, like I said, be, you'll hear about that um, more seriously in a couple of weeks. The other thing that optimizers, um, the solvers, developed were a ability to look at the constraints and detect sparseness. So that then when we came along in 2006, the solvers we used could realize that, oh, the Jacobian of these constraints um, has um, very few non-zero elements. It's a very sparse matrix. So it would detect it. We didn't have to tell it the sparseness structure. It automatically detected it and then, then created the Jacobian or Jacobian approximation that, ha that had the same special sparse structure as our problem did and then used that in the uh, optimization code. So there was an enormous improvement in, on the software side. And, and um, so in terms of bringing the ideas of automatic differentiation and uh, sparseness, ideas which had been around before but not implemented, but then they got implemented in the software. And then there was hardware progress in terms of the cost of RAM coming down. But also the thing is over 20 years, the speed of the computers went up by a factor of a thousand. I mean, that's just um, uh, the law um, that uh, every, every two years, the speed doubles, Moore's law. So, uh, so by the time 2006 came along, um, you know, Rust did the best he could have done given the relatively primitive hardware, relatively primitive software um, that was available at the time. But in 20 years, those 20 years in particular, things changed a lot. Now, some people still like to use nested fixed point methods. Um, but so now today, so this, uh, the Rust paper was published 34 years ago. Um, I suspect most of you weren't even born then. And so I ask you, you know, do you listen to the same music that your parents Listen to, do you wear the same clothes that they wore 34 years ago? And uh, anyway, um, I suspect you don't. Uh, certainly American kids make a point of not doing that. Um, so things progress, things change. And I, the, the MPEC approach is an approach that um, uh, can be used to do um, serious estimation, um, and, you, but, and get things done efficiently and quickly by using the best um, opt constrained optimization software that we have available. So that's the progress over those years. Um, and and uh, now progress is continuing. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, so, now, uh, later on in the semester, I'll be talking about uh, the more, um, after we've talked about dynamic programming and dynamic games, we'll talk about applications of these ideas to dynamic programming and dynamic games. Um, now, the, uh, so I'll get into more details, but today my, po my purpose is just to get you to, um, in a frame, a mental mindset, where you ask yourself, okay, am I doing a nested approach to a problem? 
And if I am, is there some way that I can unnest it and just write it as one big problem? And in empirical IO, that certainly is the case for um, most things I've seen. And then you can you have access to a, a much broader range of software. On the hardware side, um, the now one thing I like to have often commented on is the use of parallelism. Now, this is one dimension. I don't know if anybody's no. I don't th think anybody's done any comparison, but. Nested fixed point is something that can use parallelism. Go back to my little demand example. So now, um, if you're doing this um, degree six polynomial, um, and so you, let's say, let's, okay, so let's say here, yeah. This is a constrained optimization formulation. Now, if you were doing a nested fixed point, then what for every price quantity data point you have, you have this one um, and, and given your, uh, yeah, given, given a beta, then from the P and the Q, you can compute out what epsilon is. Now, one thing that nested fixed point could do is partial up, take these, um, this large number of equations, but parcel it up over and send it out to a number of um, processors um, and use the parallelism. And, and uh, they, they, it, it, can exp, it can exploit parallelism. So if you have a thousand cores, you can take your data set and um, have a thousand cores quickly chew up the data and give you back your whole vector of epsilons and then that um, gives you your, um, the epsilons that then go into the objective. So nested fixed point is able to exploit parallelism. The, 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 um, because the ability to use parallelism in well, the, my, my math friends tell me that there's no way to use parallelism in a generic constrained optimization problem. Now I say generic constrained optimization. Um, and that's because uh, as you iterate uh, through the various, um, let's say sequential quadratic programming or interior point method, anyway, there's, there's some interactions there across the, um, variables that make it difficult to parallelize or challenging. Now, uh, I suspect that if one exploited the very sparse structure um, that is um, available as that applies in this case, that perhaps one could parallelize um, even an SQP or interior point um, method, but that's, um, that's not a direction in which um, the math uh, people have gone. Um, so right now, um, it is uh, very straightforward, trivial to parallelize nested fixed point, um, not so easy or obvious, or the software isn't there to easily do it for um, MPEC. So that's with modern hardware, it may, that may shift things towards um, advantage towards nested fixed point. Um, but we don't know, um, my, my, my impression is that uh, the nested fixed point people do not use massive parallelism. Um, I said massive parallelism. So uh, this is speculation on my part, but I, but I like to point out here in talking about nested fixed point versus MPEG. The which is best, so people ask me which is best, which is the best method, and I say, it depends on the software you have, it depends on the hardware. In 1986, the only game in town was nested fixed point, given RAM and given what was available there. In uh, 2006, when Chaylin and I was working, MPEC was clearly the dominant way to go. Um, 
and uh, unquestionably the dominant way to go um, because you had lots of RAM, you had automatic differentiation, you had sparseness, you had these great solvers, no question um, that MPEC was the way to go. Uh, and uh, now there, there has been at least one paper claiming that um, nested fixed point is competitive with MPEC in terms of time. Um, I'll explain to you sometime down the road where uh, that comparison is totally bogus. Um, it's, it's like running a race where one runner has to run the uh, whole kilometer and the other one just basically just does a hundred yard, a hundred kilometer dash and somehow comparing those two times, it's not a, a good comparison. So MPEC really is the dominant way to go. Um, and then later on, particularly if you have multiple solution issues, um, this is something I'll talk about later. But now, thing is that now today with massive parallelism, it's unclear. Because constrained optimization software that we have does not exploit massive parallelism. Uh, so uh, it's unclear that uh, the perhaps um, for some problems nested fixed point will be the best way to go. Now, um, okay, we have time for questions, comments. Now, I know the example on demand on this demand curve was economically very trivial, mathematically also trivial, but my first question to everybody is, do you understand that that is the same as the usual approach? Um, now, some people are confused by, let's say you go back to um, this problem, the degree six uh, utility function. Now, we're trying to, we're solving out for beta, but when you do it this way, you see if you, if you were able to solve out for CI in terms of, of beta explicitly, then you just end up with this, object, this objective function just being a function of beta, um, along with the data, which are just numbers, fixed numbers. Now, so the normal thing is just focusing on beta. Now we're just saying, well, gee, now this method, you're estimating the epsilons and the CIs along with the beta. So some argue that this is a different problem. Um, now, one thing we noticed, actually the friends of ours noticed, is that uh, when somebody with an operations research background saw this, they immediately agreed, yes, these are the same things. These are, this is, these are the, these approaches solve the same problem. There's just two different ways to solve the same problem. However, uh, we often got asked that question by economists and they were skeptical. Is this really the same thing? Now, uh, one of the economists happened to be the um, editor of the Sue Judd paper. And so when he looked at the first version, um, see, I did not, I, I might have had a thought of sort of this, the, describing about how these are the same. These are two different ways to solve the same thing, but I didn't because I thought that would be kind of insulting to the reader. So I didn't. And then the editor, after seeing on the first round, said, uh, we, I want you to show some, to argue that the MPEC approach and the nested fixed point approach really are solving the same problem. So that revision um, then put forward the argument, a math argument, simple math argument, that they are the same problem. And then the editor said, take it out. So, um, uh, so that argument did not appear in the final published issue version of Sue Judd. So this, now, where this becomes a serious issue is when you start talking about doing standard errors. Because we don't really care about the CIs and the epsilon i's. We only care about beta. So when we're doing these estimation and then we did standard errors, um, what we said is, well, we do bootstrapping. And because, and we do bootstrapping and then get the distribution of beta estimates. And that's perfect, that, that, 
here's the direct way of doing things. And actually, given the theory, it's a superior way of doing things, um, as opposed to various uh, linear algebra kinds of things you're more used to. Um, so uh, if you're using bootstrap methods, uh, the CIs and the epsilon Is just kind of all disappear in the background. And then you bootstrapping, you get a distribution of values for your beta estimates and you get standard errors. Um, so these are the same problems and this, and it's straightforward to do any econometrics or on the results. Now, are, is this clear? Um, so, okay, so this time to ask questions, make comments, and the, the po po point I really want to make sure is that this is clear to you how we proceed. So, comments, questions?